Good afternoon. Thank you for sticking around. Um, spent the entire afternoon with my Victorian and just came from a very exhilarating um, breakout session and now all revved up for a keynote. Um, Patrick Corgan is a distinguished professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Prior to that, he was a professor of psychiatry, executive director of the Center for Psychiatric Reinvestigation at the University of Chicago. He's a licensed clinical psychologist, settling up and providing services for people with serious mental illness and their families for more than 30 years. Pat has been a principal investigator of federally funded studies on rehabilitation and consumer operating services. 20 years ago, he became the principal investigator of the Chicago Consortium for Sigma Research, the only I -M, sorry, N -I -M -H funded research center examining the stigma of mental illness. The Chicago Consortium evolved to the National Consortium on Stigma and Empowerment, also supported by N I M H. In 2013, he wrote took the helm of the NIH funded grant on peer navigators meant to enhance integrated care experiences for African Americans with mental illness who are homeless. In 2014, he received a grant from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute to establish a peer navigator program to facilitate engagement with integrated care for Latinos with mental illness. Dr. Corrigan, or Pat, as he prefers to be called, is a Prophetic researcher having authored or edited 12 books and more than 300 papers. He is, edit, he is the editor of the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation. There's also books that have been on sale out there as well, and he's in the process of, re of redoing a new edition on his principles and practices of psychiatric rehabilitation. I was telling him earlier, it would be one of the most dog eared books in my collection for both academic and professional reasons. So without further Thank you, Bell. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm here today to talk about something in which I feel passionate, which is the stigma of mental illness. And what I feel even more passionate about, which is how to beat the stigma of mental illness. We all know what stigma is. It's disrespectful images of people with mental illness showing them as dangerous, unpredictable, violent people. And we all know the solution, too. The solution is we want to stop it. We want to erase it. And what I want to talk to you about today is that not all ways of changing stigma work very well. In fact, we know some ways actually might make it worse. And so we'll put our heads together on what might be unintended consequences of stigma and then what might be more appropriate ways to address it. And we do this by introducing the idea of the dodo bird. The dodo bird is actually from Alice in Wonderland. In Alice in Wonderland, a dodo bird hosts a race. The end of the race concludes everybody is one and all must have prizes. Which is a problem for scientists and advocates because if everything works, you don't know what to do. People started talking about the dodo bird and they looked at the psychotherapy research and the original psychotherapy research suggested that people with schizophrenia do as well in Freudian psychoanalysis as they do in cognitive behavior therapy or psych rehab. When you think of the difficulty there, it suggests we all go out and buy a couch and we all put people in, psycho, in psychoanalysis. We know that that is not a good state of affairs, or so similarly, we know that not all ways of addressing stigma are great. In fact, some lead to unintended consequences. Let me give you an example of an unintended consequence of somebody who's quickly become a hero for me. Um, Jorge Bergoglio became Pope Francis I in his inaugural mass on March 19, 2013. He named himself after Pope Francis in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. Because as he said in his inaugural speech, he was very interested in helping the poor and the weak. Clearly a grand priority, one that most of us in the audience share. But he went one step further, he also said we need to focus on the least important. Sort of insinuating that somehow when you have struggled with being poor or weak or having a mental illness, you're somehow less important than everyone else. And you know what this does as a social agenda, as a social justice agenda, 
is it sort of suggests our role is to bestow on people, to bestow on people mental illness or rights rather than what we have people know, which is to empower them for rights. So the goal of stigma is not to bestow opportunities to people, it's to teach them, to give them the power so they can get it for themselves. Um, that was a nice job introducing uh, me. I, I appreciate it. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I've been working in the area for about 20 years. Um, I wrote one of the textbooks in psych rehab and also the editor of a journal. But I come at this with another hat that's even more important, because I am a person with lived experience. Um, I know what it means to be hospitalized and have the shame of hospitalization. About two years ago, I was hospitalized for a physical illness and called my wife up and told her to tell the kids this time I wasn't going in because I was nuts. So I know the idea of the shame and the embarrassment of being another psychiatrist getting another set of meds. And so the issue of stigma for me is not just an intellectual interest, it's a personal advocacy. And so what I'm interested in is the idea of unintended consequences and to get your hand around unintended consequences, we need to make sure we're coming at stigma from the same place. And so Sam Keen is a sociologist who wrote a book called Faces of the Enemy. And in this book, he looked at disrespectful images that people in power have used to keep people not in power one step down. And there's some pretty heinous examples in our lifetime. Perhaps one that the Americans have done for years and years is this idea of disrespecting people of African American heritage. Scientists say Negroes still in eighth stage. I put this up for a couple of reasons. One is to remind us what it means to be unjust, have prejudice and discrimination, because the experiences of people with serious mental illness are in the same box as this. And secondly, to put in perspective, this came from the 1890s biology textbook. And so what we pass off the science and in fact promote discrimination. You see it, and this is from World War II in Denmark, where we represented Jews as rats, one way of keeping people down with the disrespect of animals. And what one half of the population does to the other half of the population for centuries, so the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. If there's good news about stigma, and I don't know if you ever say there's good news about stigma, if there's good news about stigma, the racism, sexism, anti-Semitism that you see here, is largely gone from the popular media. I mean, I doubt you're going to turn on the TV and see an ad like this anymore, or Aunt Jemima, which is a disrespectful image of an African-American woman in life. All you need to do today is go home and turn on the talk radio and see the number of times they talk about wackos and psychos and nuts to know the stigma of mental illness is alive and well. And one way it shows itself is that people with mental illness are homicidal maniacs. You see it in movies, uh, the most popular, cinemania, popular cinematic maniacs in Darth Vader, our teenage kids are learning from Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street that mental illness is tied to this idea of being maniacal and crazy. You see it in Jason and Friday the 13th. But you also see it in newspapers. For example, a free mental patient kills mom from the New York Post. Or get the violent crazies off of our streets from the Daily News. They might be honest about this. These are tabloids. This is what they're supposed to do. It's not right. This is how they sell it. But you know, sometimes newspapers, even, even good newspapers, get it wrong. The, the reader, um, many of you are familiar with Chicago, is a very well done New York Times quality newspaper that comes out once a week. About three or four years ago, I ran this story with a gentleman on the left who was a physician who, in a drug induced psychosis, killed his wife soon after their wedding. And they're spending about 12 years in the Elgin Mental Health Hospital, which is the forensic unit that serves the Chicago area. By everybody's standards, he was ready to return to the community. His lawyers, her lawyers, the district attorney, uh, the psychiatrist, and Ted Klein, the author here, wrote a pretty balanced story about what this gentleman went through. Unfortunately, the editor is the one who slapped the title on this, is this man a monster? And the public reacted, he spent another two years in the forensic unit of the public. You see, in advertising, the problem with advertising is sort of in the background all the time. This offer could get you committed, crazy, the record asylum. 
So often these deals would have to be committed, maniac out of control, or a lobster lunacy. Now again, sometimes some of my friends are saying, aren't we just being a little politically correct? I mean, after all, shouldn't we lighten up a little bit? The chef does everything but cook, that's what wives are for. Well, we used to sell products for this kind of image. Uh, my wife is a public defender, so she would want to kill me if I perpetuated this kind of image. And so we no longer say it's okay to do this sort of stuff, and so no longer do we say it's okay to do ads. This is a, a straight jacket filled with nuts that won the Clio Award, which is equivalent to the Academy Awards of Advertising some years back. You see it in comics? Now, I'm Gary Larson. I love Gary Larson. I'm not sure he ever made it to this side of the border. Um, but there's several problems with this. One is the obvious image that the person on the couch is being disrespected. But two is the idea that the psychiatrist is laughing. Since the psychiatrist is laughing at it, it must be okay for anybody to laugh at. Or this, sir, these gentlemen from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are here to explain new rules of mental illness in the workplace. So the first George Bush in 1990 signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which I understand Canadians have the equivalent of. This was to offer protections and reasonable accommodations to people with disabilities. That was 1990. It was in place five years before anybody ever bothered to think it applied to psychiatric disabilities. And the EEOC is the one that said it did, and it came out with cartoons like this. S is for Stanley. Stanley, the crazy murderer who likes to murder little boys and girls early Sunday morning. Um, as parents, if anybody has Shel Silverstein, um, who again on our side of the border is big stuff, he wrote this in his A to Z dictionary. Now, most of what I've talked about is what people tend to agree to be the most troubling stigma, which is that people with mental illness are unpredictable violence dangerous, because if you're unpredictable, violent, and dangerous, I want you to stay away from me. But there are other stigmas equally a concern, and one of them is benevolent stigma. It's hard to think stigma could ever be benevolent. But a benevolent stigma is the idea that people with mental illness, adults with mental illness, are just big kids. What they need is a benevolent figure to tell them what to do. So you see this in movies. This is the Dream Team. This is Christopher Lloyd, Peter Boyle, and Michael Keaton. There are three psych patients who get away from their keeper in New York City have this zany, wacky, silly day because, after all, that's what they do. Or Jim Carrey and me, myself, and Irene, and this time we got both. We got the silly, kid-like side on the left and the big, dangerous side on the right. And what's particularly ironic about this, as some of you may know, Jim Carrey has bipolar disorder. And so when they asked him to sort of tune this down, it was about 15 years ago, before the stigma issue had taken off, um, he didn't see the wisdom in, in tuning it down. How to avoid hiring lemons, nuts, and flakes. What's particularly interesting about this is the Human Resource Department, the personnel department in a major corporation in the United States is the one that came up with it. And those are the guys who are supposed to be protecting us from these kinds of things. Is it any better? I may mean, have to admit some of this is a little old. Well, let me give you a couple examples, perhaps, of things are better. This is downstate Ohio. This is a printing company. You're looking in the front window. Pretend the woman's not there for a minute. You have two legs hanging down, a kicked over stool, and a sign saying contemplating suicide. Get your suicide notes printed here. If that's not of concern in its own right, she's the owner, and when they try to explain it to her, she didn't understand what the big deal was. Or Trenton State Hospital, people see a beautiful mind, John Nash. This is where John Nash would go when he would um, suffer a relapse. They had a, had a fire in July 2002, nobody was hurt, did some structural damage, but the next day, the headline said roasted nuts. So anecdotally, from the heart, and I'm sure everybody in the room has had examples, the stigma of mental illness is alive and well. What does the research data show? Well, a colleague of mine at Columbia, Joe Phelan and Bruce Link, did a study looking, this is an American study, I actually have some data later talking about worldwide data. 
They did a, a study looking at the degree to which the public believes people with mental illness are dangerous. Now, let me address that for a minute because, you know, especially at my side of the border, we have these horrible mass shootings where they go around because they're untreated mental illness. Um, the data on dangerousness is extremely complicated. But the long and the short of it is the public sees them as extremely more dangerous than they are. I mean, perhaps the two times people with serious mental illness are more dangerous than everybody else is one when they use drugs and alcohol, but then so is everybody in the audience who use drugs and alcohol. And two is when they're agitated, they're all wound up about something. Of course, probably, probably applies to us too. So the dangerousness thing is wrong if the public goes around and says, if you're mentally ill, you're dangerous. But they looked at this data, they compared 1956 to 1996, 40 years, and we're hoping to see a big reduction. Maybe in 1956, 40% of the population believe they're dangerous, in 1996, it went down to 20%, and it's the reverse. During that time, it doubled. It got twice as bad. That's 18 years ago. They did it in 2006, and it's equally as bad. Now, wait a minute, if we're so much more educated about mental illness than our parents and grandparents and great grandparents, how come it's getting worse? Well, probably one reason is just what I showed you on newspapers, TV, and movies is when mental illness is talked about, it's representing people as dangerous. So it makes only makes sense. But that said, there's a huge need to try to erase the stigma of mental illness. So let's do a really quick mini course on what is stigma. For me, I understand stigma by comparing different structure or different ways of different ways of understanding what stigma is. And I like to look at stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination in a group that I know a little bit about. And the stereotypes about Irish in the United States is that we're all drunks, we all do whatever the Pope says, and we beat our wives. Now, if people were honest in this room, I check at a breakout session I just did a minute ago, this side of the board knows the stereotypes about Irish too, right? So you all know we're all drunks, right? Stereotypes are unavoidable. Stereotypes occur because you live in a population. Again, on my side of the border, we all know the same stereotypes about gays, blacks, Mexicans, women, and people with mental illness. Prejudice is agreeing with the stereotype. Yep. Those Irish people are all drunks and having an emotional reaction, discrimination to the behavior. Therefore, I'm not going to rent to them, hire them, and the like. Obviously, we're much more interested in what the stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination are about mental illness. Um, the two big stereotypes about mental illness is that they're dangerous or they're weak. If they're dangerous and I agree with it, I'm going to be afraid of them. They're going to be scary. And if they're weak, I'm going to think they're bad. He said, I can't afford to be weak. I have to work hard in life. They should be ashamed of themselves. That a result of that, they should lead to discrimination like not wanting to hire or serve them or rent to them in the life. And so all these structures, prejudice and discrimination, sort out into two different, four different types. I'm just going to talk about two, which are really compelling. The first one is public stigma. That's what we, the public, do when we buy into the stereotypes and we discriminate against people. And there is clear evidence that because you have a label of mental illness, you're likely to be discriminated at employment, housing. We'll come back to health care in a minute. Educational opportunities diminish legislative support. The legislature, your parliament, doesn't want to give support to mental health programs like they should. Faith-based communities. It all leads to the idea of coercive treatment that because these people are weak, we should be telling them what to do and forcing them to take medication. Let's go to healthcare. This is one of the more sobering findings. This was done by a colleague the, at the uh, United States Veterans Administration. Here's how it worked. Veterans showed up to their primary care doctor, the GP, with symptoms to suggest a heart problem, such so that they needed a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. You know what that is? Me neither. <laughs> uh, what it meant is the primary care doctor needed to refer them to a cardiologist. In 100% of the time, if the doctor thought they were just normal folks, from their chart or past history, they did not believe they had a mental illness or substance abuse, 100% of the time they were referred to the cardiologist. 
If the doc knew he had substance abuse, it went to 80%. If the doc knew he had a mental illness, it went to 40% of the time. Stigma is no longer an abstraction, it's a life and death issue. Here's something else to think about. These are not a bunch of naive, stupid people. These are physicians. If anybody should know about mental illness, we would hope they are. So stigma and discrimination is a majorly compelling issue. The other side of stigma is what we call self-stigma. Self-stigma is what some people with lived experience do to themselves when they internalize the stereotypes and beat themselves up. And that leads to decreased self-esteem, that I'm not a worthy person because I have a mental illness, decreased self-efficacy, I'm not an able person, which leads to the why try effect, which is a big deal for rehab providers like you and me. The why try effect is why should I try to get a job, something like me is not worthy of it. And why should I try to live on my own, something like me is not able to do it. And so even though they may be in recovery, and even though there's some hope, and even though there's some self-determination, there's still going to be blocks up because you're buying into the stigma. A lot of what I showed you comes from a book called Media Madness by Our Wall. You can get this from Amazon.com. I was privileged to write a book called Don't Call Me Nuts with Bob Lundin. I'm going to introduce you to Bob again in a few minutes. Bob has schizoaffective disorder. Um, our purpose of this book was not to argue that the stigma was a problem, but more to look at the issue of how to fix it. And we updated it, and I'm pleased to see it's out there. Our challenges of stigma and mental illness has had more of an international flair. David Roa is Israeli, and Hector is uh, Chinese. And so it, um, don't call me nuts, it's 2001. This came out in 2013. But as we said, we know what the goal is. The goal is to erase stigma. The question is, how do we do it? Let's talk about some ways that don't work very well. This is the one that between you and me with the tape recorder out, this is the one that drives me nuts. Is the way to change stigma, let's just change the words. You know, for example, leprosy is now called Hansen's disease, dementia is Alzheimer's, mental retardation is intellectual disability, mania is bipolar illness, and we just decrease the stigma and all that purely by changing the name. As a matter of fact, for mental illness, our Asian colleagues are way ahead of us. So for anybody who speaks Japanese in the room, I apologize. Um, the Japanese went from Saishin Banletsu Hyo to Togo Shitko Sho. I mean, in Japanese, they went from something that means mind split disease, which is extremely disrespectful, to something called integration disorder. And the Koreans did it, and the Hong Kong Chinese did it, and people in Singapore and mainland China did it. And this provides a research opportunity to say, when the Japanese changed their name, did it have any kind of impact? And so Takashi and colleagues, um, 2009 to 2011, actually did two studies, and they found a significant change in healthcare providers. The same reason that everybody in the room learned um, DSM-5 when it came out, which is you better learn to change in the language you're not going to be able to build for. But the average public was totally oblivious to the whole thing. I mean, you call it bananas, I'll call it bananas. They just know mentally ill people are different than we are and usually bad for it. Another example, an even more compelling example, is Vin Bob Reckel. Um, he's an expert in Hansen's disease. Again, to remind you, Hansen's disease is leprosy. I thought leprosy was erased from the world. Um, leprosy is still a major problem in equatorial countries. Um, he's looked at the degree to which people stigmatize those with leprosy less because they, uh, they call it Hansen's disease. It had no difference, no effect. But here's the other problem with it. Whether I call it schizophrenia or psychosis or cingulate gyrus disorder, whenever you call somebody something, you're essentially the difference. You're still different than I am. And different is never good. It's always bad. Um, we've made big steps on my side of the border by calling people African Americans, but we'd be totally foolish to think that got rid of racism. Um, modern researchers tend to call it modern racism. A lot of it just kind of gone underground. This was a similar issue with the idea of names. Here's a policy change. Crazies now in the growing list of politically incorrect words. 
seems offensive to people of a certain mental state, which stands to be challenged. Again, the problem with just changing the words is it makes it all look really easy. And I can tell you, again, one of the problems for us at the National Institute of Mental Health is in funding resources this anymore. They think the stigma is all taken care of. And there are advocacy groups, again, in the United States who believe the stigma is not a problem because we've gotten rid of it. So changing the words isn't going to do it. What about education? To me, I think this is a big one because, you know, we like to think, uh, especially Westerners like to think, the way you handle any injustice in the world is you educate the problem away. And so people become very interested in different ways of changing stigma and what we particularly looked at is the effect education has on people. And education is interesting for unintended consequences. Does, does Canada do DARE? Does Canada do DARE? Canada did do DARE. DARE is the program where police officers go into middle schoolers, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and they talk about drugs and how not to use drugs and all the problematic side of drugs. In the United States, at 1.75% of the U.S. school districts did it. It was in 43 countries. And I'm not too old to have done it, but both of my kids did it. And here's what the research showed. Um, one study done at the Research Triangle Institute suggested it may not have any, any benefits, they weren't sure. Research done by the California Department of Education, the University of Maryland, the American Psychological Association also showed it doesn't seem to have any benefits there, even though it's in 43% of school, 75% of school districts. One study did show a significant improvement done by Indiana University. One study. It showed the kids who were in dinner were more likely to use drugs than those who weren't. So sometimes what seems to be a good idea doesn't work very well. And so sometimes we're interested in how well education works. And one way we saw, one way we saw the United States, the National Institute of Mental Health from 1990 to 2000 had a decade of the brain. And amongst other things, what they thought would go around and tell everybody the mental illness of the brain disorder and show MRI pictures of the brain and the like, the public would go around and blame them less. I mean, how do you blame people for schizophrenia and brain disorder? And lo and behold, that's what research shows. If you go around and teach people that mental illness is genetic and here's some neurons and the like, they'll endorse the stigma less. But here's the other problem. They'll also be less likely to believe they're going to recover. Is this hardwired in now? You're not going to get any better. And the problem with that is that recovery is the thing that predicts whether or not an employer is going to hire somebody or a landlord is going to rent for them or a primary care provider is going to provide a good standard of care. Because why am I as an employer going to hire somebody if they're busted and they're not going to get any better? And one, is I'm going to get stuck for the health insurance. And two, is it's just going to be a matter of time before you flip out and kill one of my coworkers. So this approach does not work very well. So we are interested more broadly at approaches to trying to change the stigma of mental illness. We were looking at the impact um, education has and whether the world has gotten any wiser about mental illness. And so we looked at study, population study. This represents 180,000 people done in 12 studies all over the world, including two studies in the United States. And we're interested in the degree to which, from 1990 to 2006, the population thought mental illnesses were inherited in genetic. Because that's what we want people to believe, right? We want them all to learn that mental illnesses are inherited in genetic. The red line is schizophrenia and the brown line is depression. And good news is the population does, in fact, now believe it's inherited in genetic. And similarly, they also believe, pretty standard level, an increase in mental illness and brain disease. So if that works, stigma should go down. And what you find is the opposite. Stigma here is defined as the degree to which I would accept you as a co-worker if I knew you had a mental illness. So going down is bad. First thing you see is depression is flat, which is really interesting when you put it in perspective, because you ask a lot of people, they all say the stigma of depression is fixed, right? Because you get uh, direct to consumer advertising, you see all these images about medication on TV, there's no more stigma. This shows it hasn't changed. And the stigma of schizophrenia has gotten worse. People are less likely to want to hire people with mental illness, and they're less likely to want to live next to people with mental illness. So even though we're more educated about it, we're stigmatizing more than ever. So here's another way we can change stigma. We can protest together. 
Shame on you. Don't think that way. So what are the pros and cons of protest? When we do this research, usually what we do is we show people disrespectful images, get the violent crazies off of our streets, and then we say, stop thinking that way. I mean, we should not think bad things about people with mental illness. And this leads to one of my most favorite studies in social psychology, the white bear effect. People know the white bear effect? We're going to do it now. For the next 60 seconds, I do not want you to think about white bears. I want you to keep them out of your head. Erase them. Gone. Uh, most of you probably have some version of the Klondike bear if I was around your head. When you ask people not to think something or to suppress something, it actually gets worse. One of my other favorite studies of all time, I didn't do this, but it's a great study. They took 200 college sophomore men, they split them into two groups, they hooked them up to something called a platysmal graph, which is something to determine whether or not the man is sexually excited. And they told this group, do not try to become sexually excited. Yep, they rose to the occasion. So telling people not to think something actually makes attitudes worse. So if you're going to go to Rotary, and by the way, I think Rotary is a great group to target for stigma because they're frequently leaders, often employers. If you go to Rotary and tell them stop thinking that way, it's going to make things worse. However, as a behavior, as an economic influence, it, protest might have some benefit to it. Wonderland was an ABC show in 2000. In the first episode, a person with serious mental illness shot at five police officers and stabbed a pregnant psychiatrist in the belly with a hypodermic needle. It only got more violent from then. So the National Alliance for Mental Illness, which has a group called Stigma Busters, you can go Google Stigma Busters. It's an online advocacy group who, when somebody does something disrespectful, they try to go after them. Organized and went after Wonderland. And they went to the network, and the long and the short of it is after four episodes, they pulled the network rather than deal with um, advocates going after the sponsors. To put that in perspective, they did not show 10 episodes. Which back then, if it was a million dollars an episode, ABC rather torch $10 million to deal with our anger. So sometimes protests can have a good effect in terms of affecting the media, but even then, other times not quite true. Psycho Donuts is a real shop. It's outside San Francisco. They have two shops, one in Campbell and one in San Jose. These are real products. The Jason Nut, the Suicide Squeeze, the Crazy Face. You go in, there's Nurse Ratchet dressed up in her white uniform. They have a, um, they have a, they have straight jackets, thank you. They have straight jackets, they have padded rooms. Really disrespectful. Again, now the organized. They started an online group. Um, help turn lemon donuts into lemonade. It was a little cute for my taste, but their goal was to try to get psycho donuts to cut it out. This time it was a really interesting finding. Stan Rizai, who is a reporter in the area, said, I'm an advocate of equal rights in a more tolerant world towards people of different races and religion, gender, and sexual orientation, but that's it. Anything else is just moronic. It became an issue of free speech an issue they should be able to say this that they want. And what happened as a result? They're franchised now. You can actually go online and sign up for a Psycho Donuts franchise for some area in Canada. And they also have Psycho Dogs, which is a hot dog franchise too. So sometimes protests can rebound and leave out intended effects. What about content? Again, in my opinion, there's two major ways of fixing stigma. Education, which is doing the myths versus the facts of mental illness, or in contact, which is people with mental illness come out and tell their stories of lived experience. And so what are the effects of contact? This is Bob Lundin. Uh, Bob and I, we feel, are spiritually connected. He was born and graduated from grade school, high school, and college within one month of me. Unfortunately, after college, he seemed to show symptoms of schizoaffective disorder and spent the next 30-some years being in a hospital, um, trying to kill himself, abusing drugs, being in trouble with the law. And so we used Bob as a person to tell his story in our research. Bob came up with a formula like this. 
I'm going to name Bob Lundin. I have a serious mental illness called schizoaffective disorder. For Bob, it's important to say his childhood was not unusual. As for Bob, he wants to address the stereotype that people with mental illness are born broken. In his case, not so. That he does, unfortunately, have a traumatic mental illness. And here's the problem with those of you with mental illness in his audience who look pretty sharp. Because when I get up and tell my story, people go, for real? Like, are you really mentally ill? They don't believe it. And so those of you with schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, they get up and tell your story, people won't believe it because you look too good. Because people with mental illness are supposed to be drooling and supposed to be disheveled, supposed to be unable to take care of themselves. And so you have to do what's called qualify. And for us, qualifying frequently, um, our research suggests, is having been hospitalized, having the immense, seeing a psychiatrist, um, having to interfere with your life. Actually, I try to qualify when I started by sharing with you the fact that I've been hospitalized, I've been immense, I have a serious mental illness. And this is what Bob needs to talk about, is how he's had a serious mental illness, and despite that, he's achieved. He's quite successful. He and I have worked together for about 10 years full-time at the University of Chicago. He has his own condo, has a significant other, travels a lot. About the only thing that's a little psychotic is he has this silver Volkswagen Beetle, which goes to tell you about taste. But otherwise, Bob's living a pretty full life, and despite that, he's pounded by the stigma of mental illness. So again, we did a meta-analysis, and the purpose of the meta-analysis was to look at how well does contact do versus education. And what we did is we looked at 72 studies on more than 30,000 people. And here's what you find. Contact is in red. Education is in blue. Contact is two to three times better. Hearing a person with mental illness tell their story has two to three times the wham on. It's just hearing an expert, hearing an expert, clinical psychologist like me tell, tell facts. Here's the other big issue. This is another paper we have coming out in psychiatric services, this follow-up. Follow-up data, so this is pre-post. Pre, you take a test, I come and tell you a story. Post, you take another test right away. Big games. Follow-up, we come a week later to see how much you remember. Education effects are gone. Any benefit to education is gone. Contact effects are about as straight as ever. So if you want to affect the stigma of mental illness, then having contact is a way to do it. Now, let me digress a minute because people say that's doggone expensive. I mean, the reality is it's going around paying people to come out with a lot more money than doing a couple of public service announcements and some ads on, on YouTube. But the reality is your country is the one country in the world that's got it right. There's a Canadian Mental Health Commission and um, I believe what you call contact-based education is largely funding people with lived experience in strategic ways to come out and tell their stories of recovery. And that's had a big impact on the stigma of mental illness. So how do we get the message out there? One way is with media. Um, so what are the, slow, the plus sides and the downsides to media? Um, our federal government came up with what a difference a friend makes. This is a public service announcement. This is a 30-second ad. A pretty cool ad. In this ad, two college kids were standing next, sitting next to each other playing a computer game. The voiceover says, what should you do if your friend has a hard time? Be there. This is a good message. Anybody see it? Now, you're not the greatest audience to ask because most of you don't live on that side of the border. When I ask audience this side in the United States, nobody sees it. Nobody sees public service announcements like this for several reasons. One is even though the Canadian and American government requires TV networks to show this, it's competing against breast cancer, child abuse, veterans benefits, all which are extremely important issues. But it's competing against those. Secondly, one way they handle it is show it at 4 o'clock in the morning, as you can't see it that way. And thirdly, the idea of residuals. I never knew what residuals were. Gilligan's Island, that's how Gilligan's Island people make money is that they keep showing it after its original time is up, they have to pay the residuals. So if you use this for more than a year, you have to go back and pay the actors more money. And nobody can afford to do that. And so these things only last a year. Now that's what a difference a friend makes. 
image. Plain clothes, everybody knows plain clothes. Anybody seen this? Plain clothes has a group called Change, Bring Change to Mind. Um, Glenn Close's sister, Jessie Close, who's in this picture, has bipolar disorder. Um, it's a, a very compelling public service announcement shot in Grand Central Station in New York. They have people paired up, all real people, like the word real. The gentleman on the left is an Iraq veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. The woman on the right is, is actually was his officer, um, battle buddy. They have one with one gentleman says schizophrenia, and next to him is a shirtless mom. Another one says, I go to store next to you on the shirt that says husband. Um, I, I will admit I'm on her advisory board and I told her I hate this. I mean, this sort of epitomizes the stigma, right? Stigma is a label, that's what we reduce this guy to, as a label. And on top of that, we really don't know anything more about the person. And on top of that, the person with the illness has to be paired with somebody who's quote unquote normal role like mom. So I'm concerned whether just because somebody is talented Gosh, this is a very moving public service announcement, but it's necessarily going to have a good impact. Um, our military has done it with wounded warrior programs. The VA has done it, make the connection.net. But at the end of the day, we want to know what difference does a public service announcement make. As people have done research, and when you look at public service announcements, you need to measure two things. One is market penetration. If I come up with a dancing cook can, as a way to promote Coca-Cola. Penetration is the degree to which an audience has never seen it. And so what a difference a friend makes when we rolled out in March 2008, 30% of the audience saw it, which is pretty darn good. The second issue is one of impact. Impact is how many people go out and buy Coca-Cola after they've seen it. Impact frequently in public service announcements is measured by websites. Almost all public service announcements have websites, which serve a really important value amongst other things. They have hot buttons for suicide prevention. So while somebody's on there, if they're being suicidal, they can hit the button or make a call. And the question is, to what degree do people go to the website after seeing the public service announcement? And what you see is at baseline time one to six months later, time two, it went from about 2,500 to 8,000. Which is there's any statistical geeks in the audience who know that's an odd ratio of 2.1, which is great. But you need to put that in perspective for something we call an effect size. For example, if you're going to come up with a new brand of aspirin, you not only want to know whether it works, you want to know how big of a bang it is. And the effect size is looked at in a graph like this, and what you want to see is an effect size way up there. And the effect size, and I'm going to speak loud for a minute, the effect size for this public service announcement is here. Yeah, this public service announcement was shown to 160 million Americans, and 80,000 people went to the website. How big of a bang for the buck is it? Even more, of the people who went to the website, 88% left after one minute. Now, I know when I'm surfing the net looking for the latest cool Dr. Jeans, that I might go on a web, and I might surf through it for 30 seconds. But what we know is something as complicated as mental health is not going to get any useful information screened through it in a minute. So I've done a lot of complaining, and well, it doesn't work. Let me share with you what we think is a model that does work. And we developed this with the state of California and the California Mental Health State Authority, and we call it TLC4. We would argue the stigma rests on the whole idea of contact. That people with mental illness need to be telling their story, they need to be targeted, local, credible, continuous change. Targeted. Who should be targeted? You know, I would like tomorrow for everybody in the world to stop stigmatizing mental illness, but that's not going to work. I mean, everybody in the world doesn't stop stigmatizing black people on my side of the border. So I want to do it, I want to be mindful of it, and I want to target people. And so I want to develop anti-stigma programs and get landlords to hire, or landlords to rent to people with mental illness, or employers to hire to them, for healthcare providers to provide a, an appropriate standard of care. I want it to be local. Actually, we rolled this program out in Ottawa Stigma Conference two years ago. We rolled it out here. And I reminded people that though we're American, any ideas from this side of the border are totally bankrupt from your side of the I mean, I think my view of Canadians is you vary us from being totally flighty to somewhere amoral. And so if you're going to do something, it needs to reflect your local issues. 
Now, I live in Chicago on that long blue thing coming down Lake Michigan. I live at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And our view of the East Coast, which is New York, and it's all amped up, and the West Coast, which is California and all at the moon, is that their ideas of stigma wouldn't work for us either. But even within the state of Illinois, and this is the state of Illinois, um, right in the middle of the country, um, again, Chicago is the big bar up there. The rest of the state is a pretty rural farming community. It doesn't really buy into what we say. So there's an expression in our world, does it play in Peoria? So if you're going to develop a program, it needs to come out of that place in which, which it's at. Even more locally, even in big cities, you know, develop things perhaps that reflects a city, an office, a church, a school, or even an ethnic group. We've worked in the west side of Chicago, which is a large area of African Americans working with people of color to develop an anti-stigma program. Actually, they developed it, and they did it, um, that reflects their interests. Good stigma change needs to be credible and continuous. Credible. Um, I have worked with our Department of Defense and our Veterans Administration, but I've never been in the military. And we pretty much know that Navy talks to Navy, Army talks to Army, Marines are better than everybody else. So if you're going to develop programs for the Army, you better make sure you come out of the Army. And then there's even a bigger issue. If you're talking to the Army, can officers talk to enlisted people? And can enlisted people talk to officers with their views of credibility? Our research generally shows that officers are credible to enlisted people. But enlisted people are not credible. Continuous. Once is good, but it's not enough. You have to do it a lot. But I'm going to skip ahead. So what we think is the grand plan of erasing a stigma of mental illness. It's people coming out. People coming out everywhere, everyone. If we were to learn anything from the lesson of gays, lesbians, bisexual, and transgender, it's over the last 40 or 50 years, attitudes and behaviors toward them has improved immensely. Not because when I was in school, somebody taught me about the genetics and hormones of gay people. It's because gay men and women came out. And you know, roughly about 10% of the population is gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. 20 to 25% of the adult population will struggle with a serious mental illness. And it's important to keep in mind that mental illness is a stigma is a lot like being gay, in the sense that I can look around the room and determine who has color and who is woman, and I can't determine who's gay or who has a mental illness, so you need to come out. And so we developed a program called Coming Out Proud to Erase the Stigma of Mental Illness, and our goal was to help people decide whether to disclose, and if so, to do something about it. The program has three lessons. The first is to consider the pros and cons of disclosing, because I do not believe you should disclose. I just believe you should consider the pros and cons of it. As a matter of fact, I think there's a lot of risks to disclosing. But I didn't think there were a lot of risks. I wouldn't be up here speaking an hour about stigma. As a matter of fact, although I'm a pretty liberal guy when it comes to disclosing, I'm extremely conservative. And the Supreme Court judge once said it's hard to stop the clanging bell. When you're out, it's awfully hard to go back in. And on top of that, people are not waiting with outstretched arms. When you're out, you're not going to get a thunderous roar of approval. You might get one or two people who have the same boat as you who will say, yeah, you may get a lot of gossip. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It means you need to rationally consider what the pros and cons are. If so, you discern different ways of disclosing, and finally, how to tell your story. Uh, we developed this about three to four years ago, originally in the United States, with sense run groups and have support from uh, people with experience both in Canada and Australia, and we did a study in Switzerland. And in this study, we looked at the degree to which people have been coming out proud, this is on the left, thought disclosing had more benefits and led to better self-esteem. And what you see is pre-post, blue to red, significant increase, which a three-week follow-up is even greater. So it seems to have a benefit. I'm a rehab 
researcher by trade, and when I'm a rehab researcher, my goal is to figure out what are good interventions for rehab providers like those of us in the room, so I talk to rehab providers about what to do. But as a stigma person, I'm not talking to professionals or paraprofessionals, I'm talking to advocates. And our history has several good examples of advocates, probably one of the best in the last 50 years is Martin Luther King Jr. But you know, mental health people have advocates too. This is Clifford Beers. Clifford Beers was hospitalized in Illinois State Hospital about two or three years at the turn of the last century. He actually came out, now think about how difficult this is coming out now. He came out more than 100 years ago with his mental illness and started what's called Mental Health America, which is one of the largest advocacy groups in the United States. And he said more than 100 years ago they must fight in the open. And so stigma is eradicated by people coming out. As I said, this is a social justice issue. So I think it's important to end with a prayer from Gandhi, who said, let our first act every morning be to make the following resolve for the day. I shall not fear, fear anyone on earth. I shall fear only God. I shall not bear ill will towards anyone. I shall not submit to injustice from anyone. I shall conquer untruth by truth. And in resisting untruth, I shall put up with all suffering. A work for him, what works for Martin Luther King works for us. Thank you. Question about fit stigma. Um, that's another area of stigma, uh, labeling and judgment and so on. So, from your research regarding impact on public stigma reduction and healthcare professional stigma reduction and others' research, what can we learn about? those, uh, the indirect effects of that on the reduction of self-stigma, how sufficient is that in regards to reducing self-stigma? So I'm going to share with you, I also seriously have a bit of a hearing disability, so I didn't catch it all. The last question? So the question was about self-stigma, and, self and how does uh, stigma reduction in regards to the public and healthcare professionals impact on self-stigma if at all. So how does the stigma of healthcare professionals impact people with experience? And the reduction. So the one thing you may be insinuating is people have done research on which group stigmatizes most. Which professional group? Lawyers, doctors, plumbers, police officers, psychiatrists? Psychiatrists. Are the most stigmatizing of groups with clinical psychologists right up there by our number two. Some ways it might make sense. I mean, psychiatrists, when I worked inpatient, when I worked emergency rooms with psychologists, I only saw people when they were really sick. And so you might think they're not going to get any better. In fact, recovery, I didn't believe recovery for the first time. I just thought that was political correctness. So an important thing is. A lot of mental health providers traditionally were likely to make stigma worse. And so people become very interested in training mental health providers. And we have two programs we're working on that are in research. One of them is at the VA I have a grant, is we're getting mental health providers, psychiatrists with mental illness at the VA to come out with their mental illness and talk to their peers about the fact that I'm just like, they're just like, we're all just like the same. And the other one we're doing is with students, so with nursing students. We have nursing students involved in a mentoring program where the mentors are people with serious mental illness, which in my opinion kind of turns the whole thing on its head. Because when I was a healthcare provider, I was learned as the great person, and those people are all down there and I'm kind of bestowing on them. And from the beginning, students are learning this the other way. 
the person with mental illness has tremendous amount of stuff to offer. And so there's both two programs we're trying out to see if we can improve the stigma uh, healthcare providers. Um, your question is, can they decrease it? There's no evidence of that. Um, what we're trying to do is keep healthcare providers from making it worse. If any healthcare provider is not likely to do it, probably those of us in the room, because we are already buying into the idea of recovery, self-determination, and empowerment. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Have you analyzed the Canadian and Australian data from the coming out crowd? So the question is whether we'd analyze the Australian and the Canadian data from coming out crowd. So the way we developed the program is Bob and I wrote it. We did huge iterations in groups with Australians, Americans, and Canadians to give what we got. Now, um, studies is we've done a study in Switzerland, and we just finished a study in California. We have not done a study of it on Australia and Canada. If anybody here wants to get a group of people with lived experience to learn it and do a study on it, we would provide technical support and actually fly here to help you do it. Um, you can go online, and everything we talked about today can be downloaded for free, including the 100-page manual, the 50-page workbook, the fidelity measure, and all sorts of stuff. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, over here. Uh, what is the step now? Now that we kind of know that coming out is uh, one of the ways that it works, how do we organize ourselves and take that in and put it into action? So, a couple things. I mean, again, in some ways, we're already using contacts to tear down stigma. And again, it's not just because I'm here. I mean, I love going around. I, I work for the Australian government, the UK. Um, the EU, I love around a lot of people that are doing dumb stuff. Um, this country does have a right. And you're already investing a lot in people with this experience going out and telling their story. Um, to take the next step, though, is how do you organize? If you go to COP program, COP coming out proud, COPprogram.org, you'll find our attempt to organize. Um, we're big in two places in the United States. The entire state of Wisconsin, the entire state of California. Now we're trying to organize them. If anybody has a similar interest and you are a person with lived experience, um, we'd be glad to talk to you. You can get, you can go through here and find me. Uh, if you want to email me directly, so now I left that off. Corrigan, C O R I G A N. Corrigan at iit.edu. If I don't get back to you within 24 hours, I'm dead. <laughs> So that meta-analysis I talked about actually does analysis of that too. Um, I didn't ask her to ask that question. Um, yes, clearly. Um, they both help um, in vivo, face-to-face, -face, living and breathing helps three to four times more. So videos are okay, but they're not nearly as potent as a living and breathing human person. I'd be glad to stay after if anybody has any questions. I noticed you. <laughs>